Hello, everyone. Wow, we are so close to 2023, and I'm so excited that Ms. Nicole Scott is our first interview heading into uh, the new year. So uh, as we said, it's at the very end, uh, pretty much, of December. So um, I, this is just exciting that it happened out this way, that it worked out this way. Today, I am interviewing uh, Ms. Scott, and along with my co-host, Monique Wells, that uh, should be a familiar face to the Front Runners League. So uh, those of you who are watching will know her from the Wells Foundation, International Foundation, uh, headquartered in Paris, France. And I'm going to let her introduce herself in just a second. Nicole Stott is our, <laughs> I just, uh, there's so many A's involved, in <laughs> aquanaut, astronaut, <laughs> all these artists, you know, it's like the triple threat there. So we'll get to, to know her in just a minute. Monique, why don't you uh, share a little bit about you in the Wells Foundation and we'll get rolling from there. All right. <clears throat> Happy to do that. So um, hi, everybody. I am Dr. Monique Y. Wells. I am the founder and CEO of the Wells International Foundation, which is domiciled actually in Houston, Texas, but run from my home in Paris, France. And I am a 30-year resident of Paris. I am a dual national French and American citizen. And I have several passions which bring me to this interview today. The Wells International Foundation, or WIF for short, has strategic focus areas in the arts, in STEAM education, in women's empowerment, travel study abroad, um, literacy, and something else I won't talk about right now. But three of those five that I've mentioned are pertinent to what Nicole Stott does. And so I can't wait to get to talk to her today. I, I love it when you say international travel. We're about to talk to someone who's been beyond international travel, uh, yes. which I absolutely adore. And just uh, so excited, Nicole, that you were able to, to join us today. And, you know, like I say, you're a triple threat, the A's, the astronaut, woman astronaut, uh, 140 days in space, uh, international space station experience, two flights uh, that culminated with all of this. And, you know, you're an, well, there's another A, author. <laughs> so we got astronaut, <laughs> aquanaut, artist, and author, and uh, also the director of the Space for Art Foundation. And we'll talk about all of these things uh, in just a few minutes. But first, tell us a little bit about your background, what brought you into this very interesting space where I'm sure not very many women have traversed. Well, you know, I think it's, it's funny because it, um, in hindsight, I guess, is how I look at it as, you know, being really thankful, quite honestly, for having parents who shared what they loved with me. Mm -hmm. uh, if I really can, you know, like lay it down on something that was very helpful for me and kind of guiding was, was that. And, you know, my mom, very creative, she's a nurse. And, um, and also, you know, I grew up in the 60s, 70s, when uh, you know, like hooked rugs and pottery and <laughs> macrame. Um, macrame, actually, yes, were, were the thing. And so she involved me in all that. So I, I feel like I had kind of this artsy side going on from, you know, or at least like liking to create things, build things. Mm -hmm. And my dad um, loved flying uh, as a hobby. He built and flew small airplanes. As a family, we hung out at the local airport all the time. I think that's where I definitely got my love of flying people people as well as flying myself and wanting to know how things fly which long story short led me to studying aeronautical engineering wanting to know how rocket ships fly <laughs> and i mean why wouldn't you you, know, you want to know how, why would you not want to know how rocket ships fly and I, you know what i'm gonna lean over and just let my dog in <laughs> <laughs> we are very, very animal friendly on the front. <laughs> so, yep, animals. And um, so th very thankful for that, because I think it helped me just discover the, the stuff that I was really inspired by, the things that I was curious about. And, you know, that led me to um, a job with NASA as an engineer at the Kennedy Space Center, where at the time I graduated was when the space shuttle program was getting back up and running after the Challenger accident. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, in all that time, astronaut really wasn't something I was thinking of beyond, wow, that's really cool. And, and I think that started back as a kid watching the moon landing, having vivid memory of that, but not not really 
I don't know, not being impacted, you know, by it in a way that said, oh, from this point forward, you know, I'm seven. I see this is a really extraordinary thing from I'm seven and I'm going to be an astronaut. That that wasn't it. I mean, for the longest time, I was the person who was like, oh, that's so cool. But that's something other special people get to do. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, why would they pick me? Even though I'm, you know, I'm doing these things with NASA and uh, and it, it and finally, I'm really thankful. I as an engineer at Kennedy Space Center, seeing all this stuff going on around me, watching astronauts come to fly on the vehicles I was helping get ready to go to space, and I finally like recognized, like, man, you know, 99.9 percent of what an astronaut does is not flying in space. It's down here on Earth, and most of it's a lot like what I was already doing as an engineer. And then again, you know, I'm a rambler, sorry. Um, the, you know, the, the thing that really was key for me was having people that I worked with that I considered to be my mentors. When I approached them, all they, all they really did, it was like they gave me permission to do the one thing I had control of in that whole process was, okay, Nikki, pick up the pen and fill out the application. That mm -hmm. was like the key. I would not have done it on my own absolutely would not have done it my own. I would have second guessed it all along thinking again, that's other special people that get to do that. And so thankful to them. When I see them, I thank them. And uh, I encourage people all the time, you know, reach out to the people that are your mentors, that some of them will know more about you than you know about yourself. And they will appreciate more about you than you appreciate about yourself. And they'll give you that permission, which I don't know if that answers the question or not, but oh, I yeah. know. <laughs> you are preaching to the choir about mentors and mentorship, I'm telling you. Yeah. Uh, we both, Monique and I, engage in um, that activity regularly. It's just oh, the well, thank you. Of the work that we do. So, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'm going to ask one more question. I'm going to bring it over to Monique, who I know has probably a list of questions. <laughs> uh, but um, so what was the first flight like when you got into the, you know, I guess the shuttle it would have been, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was it like when you blasted off? And what was it like when you finally got to the orbiting part of all that? I hear, I love this question because it allows me to like think about it again and, <laughs> you know, relive it a little bit. I'll tell you, you know, after, after working at the Kennedy Space Center for, I worked there for 10 years before um, okay. joining the astronaut office. And so, and on the space shuttle program, I got to see a lot of space shuttles launch and fly and kind of the, you know, the mechanics behind it, the logistics behind it, and, and then appreciate it through, you know, the view of watching other people launch into space. And so in some ways I thought I knew what it would be like, <laughs> and I had very high expectations for sure. You know, I was like, man, this is going to be awesome. And it was. But I, I think about it now, like what I was thinking was here yeah. and what it was like. I can't even, you know, like reach my hand up high enough. Uh, just incredible. Um, it goes from being a very still, you know, you're on the launch pad for a couple hours before mm -hmm. launching. You know, you're getting all comfy in your seat. Of course, you're laying on your back. I mean, it's like imagine if the airplane that you fly on to travel just rotated 90 degrees and was tail down to the ground and nose up uh, into yeah. the air. So you're laying on your back and, you yeah. know, you just get kind of comfy. And I remember napping a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> you know, just waiting. I mean, the crew, no, you know, the crew doesn't do a whole lot until about 20 minutes before launch. Yeah. And it was just this like still comfortable, you know, you're with these people that you've trained with for so long to go do this really incredible thing. And then that countdown starts. And honestly, I don't think you believe you're going to go until the, it hits that a kind of iconic 10, nine, eight yeah. point. Yeah. And then on the space shuttle at six seconds is when all the fuel from that big orange tank started flowing to the little three engines at the back of the, yeah. the orbiter. And I expected that to be like really, really rough and loud. And it wasn't, it was kind of this rumble. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. You know, it's just kind of rumbling, <laughs> that's weird. But at that time, like the whole vehicle tips like 10 feet and then comes back to vertical and it comes back to vertical right as the countdown hits zero. And that's what, it's like the engineers, the magic, this twang maneuver, the engineers are so awesome in that they can figure this stuff out. And then vertical, 
those big solid rocket boosters lit. And then it was like, oh my gosh, was I ever on a launch pad? It's like you're hit from behind and yeah. all of a sudden you start feeling like you're weighing more and you're shaking like I never thought I could shake. Like, And the video does not do it justice. I mean, it looks like you're shaking in the video, but it's like jello inside the way you're shaking. You, you know, you go through training for that too, right? So, but it just nothing like when you're- You you're do. But there's nothing that compares. No, there's no amusement park ride. There is nothing that no simulation. To what. No, I mean, we do a lot of simulation and it's it just, and I think that's good in some ways. I think that's good. So much of what we do in simulators is like almost exactly, except that you're not in space. Yeah. This is like, it's a new experience. And I just remember like you, you shake it and, um, and for the first two minutes, those boosters are still on. And like for the first 90 seconds, there's not a whole lot the crew can do other than monitor the displays, communicate with the ground, make sure everything is going okay. And I think on that, I'm like, man, that's really kind of good because as human beings, we have to respond to all that energy, right? This 7 million pounds of exploding rocket stuff underneath you have to respond to that. And so there's like the high five with the person sitting next to you <laughs> and the, this smile that comes across your face. You're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm doing this. And the woohoo, you know, you don't want to be unprofessional. So it's kind of a quiet woohoo. But I think we have to, I think we have to do that. We have to respond to, to it, even if we're doing it, you know, professionally. And, and then two minutes goes by, those boosters separate with a big bang and big flash. And then you're not shaking anymore, but you feel like there's three of you sitting on top of you okay. uh, as you continue to accelerate um, yeah. to space. And then six minutes go more go by and that big orange tank separates with a big boom and big flash in the window and you're in space. So eight and a half minutes. That's it. Um, for the from zero to 17,500 miles an hour and orbiting the planet in eight and a half minutes. It's incredible. And that then you're I had no idea it was that short. I know. <laughs> it's, I no it's really, really awesome to think. And it takes a lot of energy to get us out of this hold that gravity has on us, yeah. right? And, and then it's gone from this like really dynamic, almost kind of violent feeling experience to the most liberating, like peaceful, your arms are, flo I mean, everything's floating, you know, and you cannot wait to get out of your seat and float up and feel what it's going to be like to fly and float and move in three dimensions and to get to that window and um, see earth from space. And, you know, we've got about an hour or so of work we have to do before that happens. But man, once you get, I, I just, I don't remember where we were over earth when I looked out the window. I just know it was stunning. And I um, remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm actually here, you know, in space. <laughs> I'm alive. I made it alive. You know, there's that kind of thing going on in the back of your mind as well. But it was just a, such a surreal thing to, to be able to, to even say, I'm in, you know, I'm floating yeah. in space. I'm on this rocket ship. I'm looking back at earth. That's um, this overwhelmingly incredibly beautiful place that I knew was going again, I knew was going to be stunning, but I don't think I was prepared for that clarity, that translucence, that just iridescence of all these colors we know earth to be to just be there like that as a, um, and a, a, oh my gosh, we live on a planet. <laughs> like that's the way, <laughs> we wow, that. we, we, we do it and it's <laughs> round and you know, all these things. It was like just these things we know when we're in kindergarten, right? That are just this reality <laughs> check in your yeah. face. It's not yeah. a National Geographic picture or- No, it's, no. It's you living it. Oh and my gosh. a good segue, Nicole, because you, I think this was, the way you described that is almost like it's the foundational point where, you know, I don't know if you, I feel that way. I don't know if you feel that way of everything else that you've kind of done now since then. And I mean, it just feels like that experience that, oh my gosh, you know, this is what's going on is sort of the preface of, you know, everything else. So I'm going to shut up and let my mate have the floor for a minute because I know she's got questions. She's been like, like me, just like, hey. yeah. So yeah. hang it on your I can't give you a short answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, <that's all> right. <laughs> it's all right.
Well, I want to ask, I have so many things I want to ask. Um, <laughs> so just the way that you described that, I mean, I could actually, I felt like I could just sort of, I know I couldn't really feel it, but you, you just describe it so vividly. So thank you for bringing our senses to what you experienced. Um, I want to ask about being a woman in space, being a woman in the astronaut program. I don't know a lot about how uh, it's all organized. I'm a Houston. I'm a Houstonian. You know, I've heard of NASA since the beginning, um, and I know that women, quote unquote, traditionally have had a more difficult time to enter into fields such as engineering and space, et cetera. I know that there's 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 hundreds of women engineers now, thousands, you know, but to make that transition from engineering to astronaut, what does that look like? How many women are in the space program doing that? And how difficult is it, et cetera? I'm talking about this from a, a women's empowerment point of view. Well, you know, thanks for the question, because I think that, um, you know, NASA and the human spaceflight side of things, I wish I could figure out what the secret sauce is, <laughs> because it's incredible to, to just look at the evolution, you know, from, you know, like uh, from a demographic standpoint, if nothing else, just, you know, um, you know, we're right now, this year is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17, which was the last time humans walked on the moon, right? And, and now we're in this stage of transitioning from Ap the Apollo era to the Artemis era. We just had that, you know, that Artemis launch that went and without a crew and went around the moon. It was out there for 23 days, demonstrating how this technology can work again and splashed down successfully last week, I think, you know, to show us that, um, okay, there's that step that's gonna take us back with humans to the moon. And as part of, very deliberately, as part of that plan to go back to the moon, is that um, when we do that, we will have the first woman and the first person of color on that crew walking on the surface of the moon. And, and what I love about it is that we're not having to go out and say, okay, let's find a woman, let's find a person of color. It's just, okay. when you look at the astronaut corps right now and the cadre of people that are skilled and ready to go, like raising their hand, you know, send me, it's not, it, it's just, those people are there just as part of this team that's ready to go. And, you know, 50 years ago, it, it wasn't like that, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there were women and there were people of color, um, you know, making sure that we were ready to go to the moon to travel as humans to space, but you did not see them. They weren't like present in the control center or, you know, flying on the vehicles. Um, you know, when, when we launched those first men to the moon, it was one woman, in the control center at uh, in Houston, Mission Control, not in the front room. She was in the back. That was Poppy Northcutt in the back, cranking away numbers. Mm -hmm. And then you had one woman, Joanne Morgan, in the launch control center in Houston. And there's a really iconic picture of her. I mean, I swear she looks like she's 12 years old, and she's <laughs> sitting like smack dab in the middle of this, you know, this this control center of of men. And now. As we launched that Artemis flight, you know, a month or so ago, not only are women, incredible women running, leading both of those control centers, but when you look at this mix of people um, in them that are doing all the jobs, it's just this mix of humanity. You're not having to say, oh, where's Joanne anymore? It's just, and how we got there, I don't know. <laughs> I think there's certainly, I think there's certainly the attraction of space exploration and, you know, to anyone who is in the, you know, kind of these STEM fields and including women. And so that I think is part of it. I think NASA was probably very deliberate in the way they started to engage and pull, you know, this, this other talent, <laughs> 
you know, into the mix. And, um, and I can say now you asked about how many, you know, female astronauts there are right now in the NASA astronaut office, there's roughly 45 people total, uh, roughly 40% are women. And that's wow. huge. That is yes. huge. When you think about like the pool of people that we're pulling from where, um, and I, and you mentioned this, like universities, um, engineering programs struggle, most of them, to enroll and maintain an enrollment of like 20% yeah. women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's not just in the engineering fields, that's in so many of the technical fields where that's, mm -hmm. you know, that's a challenge for them. Now, I don't know what the right number is. I mean, are we not going to be happy until 47% of, you know, or 53? I mean, I don't know what the right number is, you know, mm -hmm. but making sure that women know these are opportunities for them and that the universities are welcoming and encouraging that. That's what I think we really need to be doing. And it's what I love about a conversation like we're having today is that I know that both of you are present, right? You're out there communicating with groups of young women and encouraging them and letting them know that, hey, I mean, it amazes me that somebody is encouraged by what I've done. You know, but I mean, you know, seriously, I'm like, I didn't, you know, I didn't consider myself anybody special. Right. Um, I kind of followed along with what I was excited about, you know, passion wise, curiosity wise and and reached out to the people that, you know, of whatever flavor they were to help encourage me to do that, to lift me up. And um, and I think we need to be out there doing the same thing for, you know, for other young women and as a mother of a son for the, the boys out there too, <laughs> you know, just to let them know what's available out there. Monique, do you have a follow along question? Yeah. <laughs> feel like you're, no, because she'll you're never, never off. answer in a short way. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 that's, this is good. This is good. Um, so I wanted to ask, so in reading about you and I decided that I would, again, like I did for, for whiff, I was just going to pull all of my personal and professional passions into this interview. So I thought about, okay, we've got women in space. Um, I'm also a veterinarian. I'm a veterinary pathologist and toxicologist, and I wanted to know about veterinarians in space. And so I did a Google, a very quick one. And I'm also a woman of color. Mm -hmm. And um, su it surprised me that almost immediately I found two uh, entries on Google uh, one was about a student who was at the time, she was a third year veterinary student at North Carolina, and she got an internship uh, with the head veterinarian at NASA, just like yeah. she just called him up cold call and it's like, sure, come on down. And, um, and she was able to do that. And so that's, that's been a few years ago, but, um, and now she's a, a resident at a school on the West Coast, but she wants to, when she finishes her residency, she wants to work for the space, the aerospace industry. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there was another woman who just interviewed the person who was at the helm at that time. So I wanna know about veterinarians in space. I wanna know if you've ever worked with any, I wanna know what veterinarians are doing because I'm gonna encourage, I'm rambling now, I'm not rambling, right. but I have a lot to say to, to, to put this into context. My, my nonprofit is running a program called the Youth Veterinarian Initiative. And our mission is to expose underrepresented minorities, specifically African-Americans and, and Latinx children and youth to the, to the possibility of working in veterinary medicine. And I want them to know that there are any number of things you can do as a veterinarian. And one of them, is to go into space or at least to work for the space industry. So I would like to know what personal experience you have with veterinarians at NASA, what you see them doing and how many of those people are women and how many of them are people of color. Wow, uh, yeah, great question again. And I, you know what I love about um, the space industry is that pretty much any anything you study applies in some way <laughs> to the work we're doing in space, you know, physically in space and down here on earth to prepare to go to space, to understand how 
um, we as humans, how other animals, how plant life, how all of this, you know, life that's around us could survive and thrive in these other extreme environments as well. And, um, oh my gosh, there's so many, <laughs> so many opportunities from, you know, when I think of like, you know, like veterinary, there is, there are so many opportunities. And the, the engagement I had was through people who, um, are astronauts. Um, one in particular that I know for sure, and I know there's others, but I can't remember who exactly they are. Uh, when I first got in the office, a gentleman named Rick Linehan, who is a, a veterinarian, has yes. flown in space several times, amazing guy, um, helped me learn how to do spacewalks, um, really great guy. And, and that was my first thing, like, oh my gosh, a veterinarian is an astronaut. Yeah, that makes sense. Because everything <laughs> that you're, I mean, really everything that you're going to learn and study to be a, a, a veterinarian is exactly perfect because of the same reason why somebody who studied engineering would be, um, you know, a, a candidate for an astronaut or somebody who studied biology or is a geophysicist or a medical doctor or, you know, an oceanographer, all of this kind of, you know, underlying um, understanding of science and how it applies and the way you have to take that and not just think of it theoretically, but bring it to life physically and with meaning um, mm -hmm. to the world. And so, yeah, there's, there's veterinarians that are astronauts. Um, on the ground, I will tell you that most of the veterinary contacts that I had through my training and understanding of the science we were gonna be doing in space are women. And I mean, honestly, in the labs at Houston, um, at the Johnson Space Center, I, I'm even trying to think, were there any men <laughs> that I encountered in that process? <laughs> And I think mostly they were um, kind of on the regulatory side of things. And, um, but, but I remember, you know, very vividly being in the, the labs with, with the women and it's, um, it, it just didn't, I didn't be like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in the veterinary lab. And it's, well, I didn't think about it that way. It's just now when you ask me, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's, that's who was present there. And, um, and I think on the kind of biological life science side of things, that tends to happen. And, um, and in interesting environments, I think like space flight and what we're gonna do and how we prepare ourselves, as well as the science that we're gonna do, it just seems to be that there are, are women present in those places. And it's really cool that it's just like, oh yeah, I didn't really think about it when I saw it, but you know, now asked about it, it's like, yeah, that's, and, and I think the veterinary side of things has, um, has so much potential because of the way we're going to need to live and work, not just as humans in space, but um, with other life in space when we actually settle in these different places. Mm -hmm. I think it can't just be the people, you know, the people in the plants at some point, it's gonna have to be with, um, with other animals as well. Mm -hmm. and, um, and there's so much going on right now which I love because I'm not a, um, I'm not really a supporter of animal testing for things. I mean, that has always, uh, and we don't have to go down that path here today, but it's always kind of bothered me. And so the more we can kind of break away from that, the better. And there's so much science, I think, going on with things like, um, you know, tissue chips and, um, and the way we can look at cells in space, um, you know, our own cells in space that allow us to learn about the way life can, you know, thrive in space, mm -hmm. it, um, it results in the care of the animals as well, which is a very good thing. All right. All yeah. right. So I just want to have a follow up question. So does does so is there truly a, like a veterinary core in NASA? Or is it there is, is. It, is it really? Okay. Yeah. And they are part of the overall like life science, um, health and human um, um, research side of things that, you know, and, and part of that is that we have to make sure just like any other place that has animals involved with science, that, 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 um, necessary care is there yes. as well. Yes. And so there's a lot of that, um, uh, you know, that's part of it and looking at this future exploration and how we, you know, integrate all the creatures into, <laughs> you know, what we're going, what we're going to be doing. Um, 
yeah, there is. And I'm so pleased to hear that you have been introduced to students who have found that, you know, I, I don't would say courage almost to reach out to the people that are in charge and just put themselves out there to, to yes. be considered. I mean, we need to do that for ourselves in a very Me polite too. and deliberate way, right? Mm -hmm. um, to share our talents, yeah. Yes. All right. Okay, okay Mary, back to you. Awesome about this. I see a potential <laughs> partnership with the Well <laughs> yeah. Foundation and you know, some learning and research and yeah. uh, a broad stuff. And, Happy to introduce yeah. you to people too. <laughs> Yay. That's what we hope happens. Yeah. yeah. And, All right. So, yeah. Um, Aquanaut, I wanted to touch on a couple of things because we need to wind up in the, about the next 10 minutes. But um, you're not only in space, you're underwater. <laughs> you go down and I wanted to hit on that a minute before we talked about your art artistry and then talked about the, you know, the foundation and the book. So we can end up with that. But, you know, how did you end up doing the Aquanaut thing? <laughs> oh, I'm so thankful for that. Oh, my gosh. Um, and of course, that was before flying in space. And, yeah. and it was a very purposeful preparation for, okay. for flying to space. Oh, and is that right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, NASA is really good. I, I'm not, well, I would say all of the training in one way or another that we do, whether you're learning to speak another language or you're studying the science or you're, you know, working on the emergencies that might happen while you're in space or launching or landing, all of it in one way or another is... Um, focused on how you work as an effective team, as a crew, and uh, the absolute best analog to um, flying in space was this experience living underwater. And um, I had the chance to live for 18 days um, on the Aquarius undersea habitat. It's an undersea lab that's about the size of a school bus. It sits at 60 feet underwater off the coast of Key Largo, Florida. And this most oh, like incredible, <laughs> uh, you know, preserved, yeah. beautiful reef um, environment. Talk about animals and life around you, just stunning. And, um, and the reason it's such a great analog is that once you're down there for an hour, you can't just swim safely to the surface, right? Your body's saturated with nitrogen. You have to stay in that place. And we live at that depth pressure for the time that we're down there. And then we go through a very special process to close up the habitat and then, you know, decompress to be able to safely come back to the surface. So just like in space where if something goes wrong, you can't just hop in your spaceship and come home and, you know, bail anytime you want. You've got to learn how to as a team to deal with it right there, you know, to be in that place and not freak out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, not leave your crew people behind. I mean, you got to learn how to take care of each other. You have to deal with it right there. And that the same is true in that undersea environment where, you know, you can't swim safely to the surface to escape a problem because your body's so saturated with nitrogen, you'll, you know, be severely impaired or likely die if you do that. And um, everything that we do inside the habitat and then to go outside and explore the ocean, you know, the ocean environment around us is a perfect parallel to what we do in space. You know, you got to put on special equipment to go outside. You've got to be very considerate of um, your crewmates and that equipment. I mean, everything about it is the science we're doing down there. It's all, it's just a wonderful, and we kind of joke though. I think it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's true. It's like we get to go live and work in inner space mm. to learn how to live and work in outer space. And, oh my gosh, you talked okay. about that looking out the window thing. The same thing is true there, you know, except now the, the, the planet is surrounding you, right? You're in it. You're part of it. The, the creatures out there are looking in to see who's in the looking at you. today, you know, <laughs> like, you know, like we're the weird ones in that place, right? You know, it's amazing, amazing. And I highly recommend it. Just like I do this baby, I highly recommend Damn, it. I want to do yeah. it. Damn. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh my goodness, that's fantastic. And you just, you kind of revealed that artist in you, right? And then you did it before <laughs> we were first talking about your experience and seeing um, planet Earth. Tell us a little bit about that. I mean, clearly that's always been part of your nature and part of your character is that you're an artist. And so how did you decide to kind of transform uh, what you're seeing and experiencing into an art form? 
Yeah. I mean, I always have loved, you know, that kind of creative stuff. Again, thankful to my mom for um, encouraging that kind of thing while I was growing up. And um, when I, I think the thing that really kind of brought it all together was, and, I, and I'm very thankful to a friend who encouraged me to do this because uh, I would not, again, I somehow I don't think about these really incredible <laughs> things on my own. You know, it takes the, the people around you to, <laughs> to get you, you know, get you thinking about this stuff. But, you know, to a friend who worked at NASA at the time while I was preparing to fly to space, who helped, she's Mary Jane Anderson. She's the one who helped us pack all of the stuff we were going to take to space with us. And as crew members, we were allotted like this little bag, you know, to take with personal items to space. And I took a little stuffed animal from my son, who was seven at the time, my husband's St. Christopher medal, you know, things that are special and pictures of family and friends. And she's like, you know, Nicole, you're going to be up there for months at a time. You're not just going to be working. You're going to be living there too. You will have some free time. So think about something you might want to take with you that you could occupy that time with that you would really enjoy. And so I ended up bringing this little watercolor kit with me and painting while I was there. And I don't know, it just felt like, you know, those are the kinds of things we do as humans to bring our humanity with us. And I think no matter where we go, that happens. And so I like to think about, oh, that's, this is painting in space. It's one of those put the human in human space flight kind of <laughs> things, you know, that NASA isn't necessarily thinking of though I think they are more now as we're talking about longer duration missions. But we've been doing this since the beginning. People have been painting, playing music, <clears throat> writing poetry, all of this in space. And so watercolor painting was a thing for me. It was a really nice way to kind of personally capture what I was seeing through the window to um, take what turns out to be my favorite image picture that I took from space and you know turn that into a painting. And then that over time, as I was thinking about retiring from NASA, really evolved. I just kept coming back to that experience. And I'm like, okay, you know, I'm going to use my art. That's going to be the way once I retire from NASA that I'm going to communicate this experience I've had in space. Everything from, you know, the beauty of what I saw to this need to recognize that all of us need to recognize that, oh my gosh, we live on a planet. We're all earthlings, thin blue line, you know, need to be crewmates, not past all of that stuff really came to life to me through the art. And I wanted people to appreciate that. And I thought my artwork might be able to do that as well as encouraging people to understand what's going on in space that ultimately is all about improving life on earth. I think that's sort of, that's the thing that I get from the book that you've written. And I yeah. know that's been out for about um, a year and it has a long title because it gives, it gives you the, <laughs> the point, the message that you're trying to get across. So I wrote it down. It's like back to earth, um, what life in space taught me about our home planet and then and our mission <laughs> to um, to protect it. And, yeah. uh, you know, first I thought, well, is that about climate change? I think it's about planet protection that incorporates the, you know, uh, everything that we want to do about climate action and to keep our planet safe. Um you clearly, you know, what you just said kind of segues right into probably the reason why you wrote the book, but tell us a little bit about the book and uh, give us the why people need to paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, what, what I, I never wanted to write a memoir, right? I, I'm, if I do that, it's got to be a kid's book, you know, the whole like inspiration yes. <laughs> side of things, you know, kid's booky kind of thing. But I really felt like, um, and I appreciate you saying it the way you did, because I, I really felt like this, this experience in space, you know, it's a really complex thing, right? Just to get off a planet to space, to live and work there for a short period of time, to get home safely, all the science we're doing, the international, it's all really complex. And yet there was a simplicity to it as well that I think really stood out to me. Um, and that's what I want the book to bring to life um, is what, you know, what we just talked about, this idea that, oh my gosh, you know, we live on a planet. <laughs> We're all earthlings. Only border that matters is that thin blue line of atmosphere. And that be by behaving like crewmates, not passengers. You know, we have the power to create a future for all life on earth that's as beautiful as it looks from space. And, you know, the, the way I tried to do that in the book and climate change, you know, climate protection of our planet all comes across in there. But I think the, the message applies to any 
big challenge that we have. And, um, and, and the simplest way it's like, man, we go, we build this mechanical life support system in space, right? For six or seven people from these 15 different countries to live and work on every day on that spaceship, we're acutely aware of how much CO2 is in our atmosphere, how much clean drinking water we have, the integrity of our thin metal hull, the health and well-being of all our crewmates. And we are because we have to be <laughs> just to survive there. And it is such a perfect parallel to what, you know, I guess it's 8 billion people now, you know, down here on this planet need to be doing as well. It's and I realize it's orders of magnitude in terms of numbers <laughs> and size and all that kind of thing. But that underlying simplicity, I think, is what can yeah. kind of guide us to the solutions. And that was the big if thing for me. We're going to take the presidents of every country yeah. <laughs> and put them in a spaceship. Yeah. Damn, see planet Earth. You know, what struck me is when you said, when you looked out the first time, you did not know where. The, you know, where you were, what you were over, what country, what place, what anything yep. that you were over, you just saw the whole planet. If we could all have that experience of understanding, we don't know where, you know, this dark place right here on this yeah. planet is, we just see the whole planet. And I think that was an extraordinary statement you said, because it stuck with me. And I'm like, you know, it's not like you can pinpoint something. Oh, yeah, there's my house or there's yeah. the there's, you know, Argentina over here. I'm over Argentina. You don't know that. But I think that's just really amazing that um, if we can get that viewpoint and have it stick and understand that, you know, we're just this little peon. <laughs> you know, first. Significant, so, though, I think yeah. hugely significant in, in all of that. Right. And I, that's what I, I, I want the book to do. Encourage people to consider right? And, and the bottom line, we're all in space. Yeah. Too. You know, it's not like, you know, you go on a spaceship and you're in space. I mean, we are a planet in space and mm -hmm. every day around us, there is awe and wonder that can bring to life that exact feeling of looking out the window of a spaceship. We just have to open our hearts and our minds to it, I think. Mm -hmm. And we can look at your art Beautiful. and then we'll come out. Yeah. <laughs> this is, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, I end up with the last question or two. Monique, any final comments or? Feedback? I just want to say, I want to say thank you for just being you and doing what you do and sharing, sharing, you know, so many people um, are not aware and all they need really is to hear a particular voice um, with a particular tone and the, the energy that comes through. And I just, I love your humility. Um, and I just thank you for being who you are and doing what you've done and sharing that information with the world. And we will take your story forward and share it further. And who knows, who knows what will happen, but I think it can only come to good. Well, I, I so appreciate that. And I'm gonna throw the thanks and the gratitude back at both of you because um, I really appreciate you inviting me to be part of this conversation. and. And the awareness I now have of what the two of you are doing, which speaks exactly, you know, um, Monique, to what you just said to me, um, you know, taking this love that we have, this passion that we have and bringing it to life in different ways. And man, I, you know, I got this art spacesuit behind me. This would not be behind me if it, it wasn't for, you know, feeling like I, I could bring what I love together. Right. Um, and you know, thankful that I know now that this, this mission I had in space has brought me to perhaps a greater good mission of, you know, the work with the Space for Art Foundation and where we say we're uniting a planetary community of children <laughs> through the awe and wonder of space exploration and the healing power of art. It's certainly, I think, bringing these kids together, you know, who are going through stuff you don't want any child to have to go through, you know, together in a really beautiful, creative way that allows them to think about their futures beyond what's happening with them right at that moment, kind of a transcendent thing. But what I love too, is that there's this kind of kindred spirit thing that comes out of it to, to be introduced to, to you two <laughs> in this way to know that there's these other incredible things going on around the world that are really so positive and powerful. Um, it makes me, it, it gives me hope. I mean, it really makes me know that we we have 
you know, we have the power <laughs> as earthlings to, to make life better for everyone. Yeah. yeah. And thank you for bringing that up. I was going to mention the, that you're the director of the you know, Space for Art Foundation. I, you know, I feel like we weren't able to do justice to that. So I have a, I have a suggestion. <laughs> okay. um, I think maybe Monique can interview you and we'll take that interview and repost it ourselves. Okay. <laughs> About the, the art, because I feel like there's a partnership forming here. I love watching that. Yeah. So I mean, Me too. You, you and Nicole, you can you do that. We'll and, set that up. Yeah, you set it up. You I haven't heard the last of me, ladies. I'll be mean, we working <laughs> on projects and needing to reach kids around the world. Yeah, I we're, we're on board with you. you. Yeah, we're your new best friends. <laughs> so we're very global. Uh, you know, I'm just a uh, right. You know, I kind of I look at the peace building side of what you know how you were talking about. Um, you know, that's why I brought up. We're going to put all the presidents yeah. up there. And Absolutely. Make them communicate and see see Earth the way that we see it. But uh, peace building is very definitely a part of what I do and the way that I look at when I reach out to people all over the, the world. Some of them may never talk to another person from the United States in their life. Yeah, I may be it because some of these little tiny countries, um, you know, they, they yeah. just don't know. I just, you know, somehow we happen to connect and that's how it worked. But uh, and even some of these tiny little communities in these bigger countries may never yeah. you know, that I end up getting connected with. So I kind of take take that to heart and know that that's part of my job is to make sure that they feel championed and that there is a connection there that's going to last and, you know, not just be a name yeah. on a mail list. It's going to be a lasting um, conversational, lasting relationship. So um, I want to say this is, this is great. We are going to look before we, you know, end this, let me ask you the final question. I always ask everybody, which is who do you need to meet to move you forward in what you're doing, Nicole? Oh, wow. Who do I need to meet to move me forward? I think more, more, more people like Monique. <laughs> well, you know she what is I mean? very special. So. I'm, but I'm serious. I, and I know, you know, it's um, where just to... the, the love, the love of what um, you've already done, what you want to do has come together in such a powerful way. Um, and this willingness to like share it. I mean, that's what we've been so blessed with so far is this kind of the serendipity of people coming along that are like, how, how do we be part of this? You know, how do we be part of this? And it's funny how, you know, you can, I, I don't know if you guys experience this too, where there is something to having that warm fuzzy, you know, kind of in your gut that tells you, okay, this is somebody that is, you know, of the same spirit. And then there's the not so much and being able to be directed that way is really really nice and to be able to trust you know someone who's already had that experience with somebody is a good thing yes well, Monique yeah. is very special so yeah. Yeah, I knew I knew immediately <laughs> to have as a co-host for this so there are other few people I think would be in a different way but yeah they're, they're, they're part of our uh, front runners league that would be kind of interested in having a conversation with you so we'll um we'll see how we can kind of interconnect those but I, I don't know that I see with them the same thing I see with Monique. And I knew that there could be some potential there with cool. um, collaboration and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I would hope you would continue that. That's for sure. Most so definitely. I'm going to, I'm going to say, thank you, Monique. Thank you, Nicole. Very, you very welcome. Much. And uh, I want to say this to everyone else watching. If you're watching this on YouTube, go to www.frontrunnersinnovate.com. You'll get this interview. Uh, you'll get to see a cover of the book that Nicole has, plus the link to where to go get the book, some information that she'll give us on how you can connect with her through uh, Space for Art Foundation and other links that maybe some social links that she can provide to us along with this interview. You'll get some more information there. So definitely go do that. And I want to say again, thanks again, everybody. And happy front run. Take care. Thank you. Thank and you. happy new year. <laughs>